This is the Puck Poolies Podcast with Matt Larkin and Stephen Ellis. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the Puck Poolies Podcast presented by ProLine Plus. It's Matt Larkin here with Stephen Ellis. It feels like we've been apart for a while, Stephen. We were both away. It's been a couple weeks. It's good to be back and talk a little fantasy hockey. So update me on your cute little four-team league and how are you doing since we last spoke, my friend? Well, it was kind of it was really close the first few days, uh, and part of that was because I just didn't set my lineups the first two days of the week, so it wasn't great. But I was playing the second place team, and at one point it was, and I've explained this on the show, I was dominating for a while, and then things started to kind of mellow out. Everyone started to kind of get better, and then the the guy of Connor McDavid was starting to make some damage, as you'd expect. But for me, I played the second best team. But I beat him by about 140 points because I just had a great final couple days and our goaltending was getting the job done. Uh, and, you know, that was, that was what I needed. Uh, and I'm already leading after day one, even though I'm beating a guy who just got a couple goals from Connor McDavid last night. So uh, I'm, um, I'm happy right now where I am. And, uh, you know, playoffs are coming soon. Okay, that's good. My team's streak has continued since our last episode, so I'm up to 10 wins in a row. I haven't lost in the year 2023. My team is just an absolute wagon. Even though I have Patrick Kane and Jacob Tricker and Tanner Janot, I had, like, I was going to rename my my team trade-related reasons. I had to sit <laughs> all these guys, but I've still kept winning. It's still frustrating, though, because I'm in a similar situation to, for example, the Leafs and Lightning, where I can't move. Like, I have a 30-point lead for my division but I can't catch the other seed. So I'm locked into like a four versus five because the teams in the other divisions, they're shit there with the tanking teams and they just get to beat them like 13, nothing. Every time they play them, they get to play them three times and I only get to play those teams once. So they fattened up their records. So I can't catch those teams, which is frustrating. I'm going to have a tougher matchup four versus five, but at least I'm, I'm locked into my spot. I've got my division kind of locked up. So could be worse. Okay. Well, let's do some pickup talk, Steven. It's been a while. So let's dive in my friend. All right, we'll start off with some shallow league pickup of the week, and that is Dawson Mercer, a guy that has been kind of a lot of people thought he was going to be traded, and obviously was not part of that Timo Meyer trade. That's right. Big coup for the Devils. They managed to hold on to Mercer and Alexander Holtz and also Luke Hughes and Simon Namich and all these good players they didn't have to trade in, in that deal for Meyer, so it was a great deal for them. Dawson Mercer available in 63% of Yahoo leagues, and there might be a concern that Timo Meyer's presence will push Mercer down the lineup. I wouldn't really worry... Because Mercer's so versatile, you can play him kind of anywhere on any part of a line. You can play him anywhere of the top three lines. And he can play center as well. And I think it's eight goals and 10 points in his last six games, 11 goals in his past 19 games. He has had a major uptick in his shooting percentage, but also his shot outputs up. So he's sort of earning that extra shooting percentage because he's just putting more pucks on net. So even though we can expect a regression in shooting percentage, just the output is higher, so that will keep the goal total, I think, higher than it was earlier this season. So I'm bullish right now on Dawson Mercer. All right. This one's going to be a little obscure. Michael Matheson for the medium pickup. Yes, this is a weird one. I picked him up in my league, and I was thinking, what's going on here with Michael Matheson? I know if you go way back to his prospect days, he might have been perceived as someone who had a bit of offense to his game, but that has not been his NHL identity at all. And it's just a matter of opportunity. The Habs have nobody. They've just handed Michael Matheson the number one power play job. He's got nine points in his last nine games. He's playing more than 24 minutes a night. So he's also averaging more than two shots per game on the season. He's averaging more than a hit, more than a block per game. So he's suddenly becoming a pretty versatile contributor. I don't know if it's going to last for the rest of the season, but right now he's performing as an extremely valuable fantasy defenseman and not many people know about it. He's available in 80% of leagues. And again, I just don't know what the competition is going to be for those minutes in Montreal for the rest of the season. So you may as well just ride that wave and see how long he can keep this going. The logic makes sense. The player might not, but no, the logic holds up there. And this one's another very interesting one for uh, the deep league pickup. Fabian Zetterland. Yes, Fabian Zetterland, now a San Jose Shark. And at the time that I was checking his ownership stat, it was 100% available. Literally, according to Yahoo, not one person on planet Earth <laughs> owns him in a fantasy league. I don't know if they do some rounding because you'd think that maybe Fabian Zetterland or his own family, his parents, if they played fantasy, would own him. But according to what I've checked, he is 100% available in Yahoo leagues. And 
you might think, well, he got traded to the San Jose Sharks as part of the Meyer deal. His value is going to go down. I wouldn't be so sure. He was only playing 12 minutes a night as a New Jersey Devil. He was extremely efficient, 20 points in 45 games. Deceiving number because he's playing 12.57 per game. He actually is top 20 in the NHL, five on five in primary assists per 60 minutes. And he has 34 hits. Again, that hit total is deceptively low because he's only playing just under 13 minutes a game. So... Now the Sharks have every reason just to hand him a top six role. Yes, he won't be playing with the same quality of line mates, but the big increase in ice time that I'm expecting will offset that. So I wouldn't be surprised if you get to see him play 16 minutes, 17 minutes a night for the rest of the season, and he could be a sneaky, useful guy because why not throw him into the top six? Very similar to what Vancouver did with Anthony Beauvillier, who's been a point-per-game player since coming over in that trade. They figure, well, we got this guy. He's sort of a throw-in, but let's see what he can do. Throw him into a big role. I could see the Sharks doing the exact same thing with Fabian Zetterland. I'm looking right now at the comments um, on Fabian Zetterland on, on Yahoo, and it says, how did the Sharks actually accept you for Timo Meyer? Uh, <laughs> people are saying that he was playing a bit with uh, Jack Hughes. Uh, he should be in the top line. Uh, so, beep! Uh, I think it's over, boys. He sucks. Uh, buddy, my league doesn't give points for cardio sessions. It's time for you to put up something. <laughs> yeah, I, it's, it still says 0%. Uh, those, those, those comment boards and like when you click on a player in Yahoo are so funny. Love it's them. like I hate comments on like Facebook posts or things like that. But I don't know. Yahoo, it's the best. It's like it's I, I've now become a, a Google troll where i go when i go to places i'll write a review for somewhere i've been but i'll sit i'll focus on something completely random there like when i was at magic kingdom i was like man the bathrooms are super clean like just like something that's completely random that's what it feels like when i'm reading yahoo uh thanks but it, I, lo I love it the wtf pickup of the week is a play that makes a bit more sense though bowen back Yes, it's Bowen Byram. He's available in 32% of leagues. And the thing with Bowen Byram is it's never a matter of talent. He's an A-grade talent. He was considered the top prospect in the NHL for at least a year before he joined the Avalanche for, for good. Uh, we know, of course, he's had some major history of uh, concussion history, concussion complications in his career. So you're always worried about the next mysterious upper body injury. But for now, he's in the lineup and he is replacing Kale McCarr, who was out with his own upper body injury, the concussion problems. And that means Byram is on that top power play unit with a lot of great talent around him. And he's just been a stud whenever he's in the lineup. In the last two seasons combined, he's only played 49 games, but he's got 10 goals, 30 points, 86 hits. He's someone who can give you a little bit of everything. And as long as Bakar is out and as long as Byram is healthy, he's going to be, I think, not maybe not quite an upper echelon fantasy defenseman yet at his age, but I think a good maybe second defenseman. So he should be owned, I think, almost everywhere. Okay. I'm going to do the tip of the week this week. And yes, this you is are. One, this is one where I you can't overreact to early projections. Uh, when you look at like on Yahoo and you look at the head to head and you see like oh like my my opponent's going to be get 510 points and I'm projected to get 475, so I got to do something to change that. It's that would get you in trouble. And I learned that very early on when I needed my goalies to play a. To, to be have a big role that week and i had at the time Linus solmark i had uh uh igor shesterkin and i had uh earlier soroka and that became a situation where i gave up Olmark because he wasn't playing as much that week and i was thinking well maybe no one will pick him up maybe i'll be able to pick him up later on it won't be a big deal but this week i need to go get another guy who can go out there and maybe get some extra starts based off the schedules blah 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 well that did not work. I actually lost that week. And look how that one goalie's doing really well right now. And uh, my goalies have been good, but not great. And uh, so I've been kind of doing a rotating cast of goalies to make up for it. But if you you see you're not going to win, just remember that could all change like the second day of the week. On Monday, I was projected to lose. Now I'm projected to win by quite a bit. So it, it happens just depending on, you know, it's a predictive formula. It's based off of what these players have been doing. But if, if, McDavid goes out and doesn't get a point for two games in a row. That's going to change everything. So uh, I'd say it's something where you just don't overreact to it. Save your roster openings and, and any transactions you can make for later when you really need it. Because at this point, uh, I, I learned the hard way and I had to kind of recover for a couple of weeks where I made some moves to, to act in the now based off of the projections and I didn't end up winning. Okay, that's that's good advice. It's advice I should probably take because I'm an overreactor. I usually have double the moves of the next closest team almost every year in my league. 
uh, because we don't have a limit on, on transactions. And overreacting it famously cost me a title one year where I made a, a galaxy brain drop of a player, and then that guy got two assists on the final day of the season. And that literally was the difference between winning and losing, as I've said on this show before. It still haunts me. That was 10 years ago. Man, <laughs> man. Okay, now, Stephen, we're going to pivot. We're going to bring in a special guest, someone whose work I've followed for a long time, and we get to meet him for the first time. Scott Cullen is up next. Okay, we are pleased to be joined by a longtime heavy hitter in the fantasy hockey industry from Sportsbook Review. He is a sports betting analyst. He also, of course, works with McKean's Hockey as a contributor. Scott Cullen, longtime fan, first-time interviewer. Welcome to Puck Pooley's, my friend. How you doing? Hey, thanks for having me. I'm, I'm, I'm good. All right. So as I've said, you've always been known to me as someone who is one of the biggest voices in fantasy hockey for as long as I've been following it, especially in the, in the Twitter era. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm curious now, a lot of the work you're doing has a sports betting slant as well. So what inspired you to sort of take that plunge and go into the sports betting sphere? Well, I think it's market forces, really. Um, when I first started doing fantasy, uh, it, that was basically the way that I could combine, you know, my interest in hockey and math. And <laughs> there are not a lot of people who are, who were interested in that, but I was. Um, and so when TSN decided to start doing some fantasy hockey, I was kind of the guy they steered into doing it because I was the, you know, the guy who was in all the pools and the guy who was into all the numbers. And so that went great for a while. And then hockey analytics came around. And so I started doing some more of that. And, and as kind of time has gone on, sports betting is now a space where there are lo lots of ways to write with data and, and analyze hockey. And so that's kind of where I've gone. This is not any kind of, oh, I don't like fantasy anymore. I'd be happy to keep writing about fantasy. I'm happy to write about analytics. But in this case, there's a new avenue. And, and so sports betting has allowed me to uh, kind of continue to write consistently about hockey with analysis and data and all that so that's it, it, it like i say it's market forces really if 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 sports betting had been this widespread thing 20 years ago i probably would have been steered to it then hmm. so what's your favorite way to bet in hockey is it dfs is it in-game betting futures and what why do you like that i think i've i've gravitated towards uh player props like i'll, I'll do you know sides and totals and and anything else but one of the things about player props is you can kind of pick and choose in in maybe a game that you don't have a strong opinion on the teams like for example um in monday night's game the chicago blackhawks were playing the anaheim ducks like a, a dreadful dreadful game <laughs> but as i'm going through the the numbers for the game i'm like ah, a troy terry anytime goal doesn't look too bad <laughs> and so i i picked a troy terry anytime goal it is literally the only reason for me to watch that game. <laughs> um, and fortunately enough, Terry scored. But this is really about the um, kind of keeping interest in in a variety of games. Like, if, you know, tonight there's 10 games on the schedule. I'll probably pick a few games based on, you know, who I think is going to win. But then there will be several more games where I'm grabbing player props, whether it's uh, goal scorers, shots, or points. I just kind of, you, you uh, fall into sort of, there are players who, who you kind of see value in, and sometimes that value stays for a long time, and sometimes it lasts for like two weeks. <laughs> but it just kind of depends on how the market responds to it. Like there was a long stretch early this year where Martin Nietzsche was undervalued night after night after night, and it was just like, well, we're just going to keep hitting that. And then at some point, Nietzsche slows down, and you go, okay, time to get out. And, and so the, the, the one thing that's made prop betting to me uh, entertaining is that you get kind of a refresh every day. And, and so, you know, yes, I can have certain players that I, I prefer and that I look, look to on a regular basis, but then you can bail out on them, you know, the moment the odds change or the moment that their, their production goes up. I see. And that's, that's good advice. And it's a segue to my next question because, you know, I, I, I do dish out some betting advice on this podcast. I don't necessarily really know what I'm doing, but I give it my best shot. Uh, but you're someone who really does know what he's doing. So I'm curious, is there sort of a, a general piece of advice that you think is really important that you could pass on to a novice better who's trying to get their feet wet? 
Well, the the first piece of advice, I, I and I and I say this, recognizing it's a bit of a leap for a novice better, but sign up for more than one sports book, because and I say this for more than twenty years, I had an account with one sports book, hmm. and because I was a casual better, I didn't I didn't see a ton of value, and and honestly, say you're betting NFL games on a Sunday, the lines don't vary that much from one to the next, but once you start into especially player props things like that there can be a real difference in price right mm. and and so the value that i got on say a troy terry goal on monday night was substantially more at one sports book than it was at another and and so as i say this yes it, it's asking a lot for somebody who's a new sports better to get two or three different places to do their sports betting um it gives you a better chance of success and, and the comparison I make is like, if you're going grocery shopping, you could go to one store and get everything, right? And that and that's fine. But if you're looking for the best prices, you probably have to go to more than one place. Mm. Um, so now that's a general sports betting uh, tip. For hockey bettors, I think information is the key, right? You always have to track injuries, starting goaltenders, and and beware of taking teams that played the night before uh, in, in general i i like even if it looks like oh wow this is a mismatch but yeah but they played the night before i'm not interested <laughs> okay, okay. Oh, that makes sense so give me your fave stanley cup futures bets for the rest of the season well the interesting thing about like when you're looking at futures and and a lot of times you go oh well who do you think is going to win sure like obviously Boston's the the favorite right now for the Stanley Cup, but it, you know Toronto and Carolina are right up there too. But I don't think there's great value with them because right now the Eastern Conference looks like a war zone, right? <laughs> teams just keep loading up and loading up, and and a lot of those teams are going to end up being disappointed. So I, I don't think that there's you know great value to get in at Boston at plus four fifty or whatever they are, uh, depending on the sports book. Um, so the value that I see is, is to look to Western conference teams. And I, I've got kind of three here, uh, Vegas, Edmonton, and Dallas are all in the plus 1400 plus 1500 range. And you as assume that they're going to make moves before the trade deadline. Um, if you know, one of those teams makes the kind of move that, you know, might push them up over the top to at least win the conference, then, you know, there's a lot better value getting them at plus 1400 plus 1500. So, do, do I have one pick for you out of those three teams? Not really. It's kind of who do you think is going to be able to uh, make that move? I mean, it, I, I watched the Oilers play the Bruins last night, and I thought, eh, if, if the Oilers improve a little bit, give them Evander Kane in the lineup, maybe there's some value there. Hmm. Well, that's good to know because in our betting segment later in the show, I, I have a similar line of thinking. So you made me feel good about myself, Scott. I appreciate that. Uh, so I want to shift gears now to just some pure fantasy talk. Uh, and I'm curious, so obviously we're recording this on a Tuesday morning, so we're close to the trade deadline, but who is a player whose trade value you think is going to rise as a result of the deadline and someone whose value you think will be damaged? And that could be someone who's been traded already or someone you expect to be moved in the next few days. Either answer yeah. would work. Yeah, um, well, for players who I think will see their value go up, I think Ryan O'Reilly is obvious, like, he, he's really had a rough year in St. Louis, but when you move him to Toronto and he goes to play with Tavares and Marner, now it's Tavares and Nylander, it looks like. Either way, massive upgrade on what he uh, had to deal with in, in St. Louis. So I think that takes Ryan O'Reilly from a guy who I think in most fantasy leagues was getting dropped. All of a sudden, he becomes relevant again for uh, the rest of the season. Now, if you want to go a little kind of off the radar or whatever, I think keep an eye on Yusuf Alamaki in uh, Arizona because he's been getting some power play time with Jacob Chikrin sitting out and Gostas Bear being hurt. If both those guys get traded, Valimaki would seem to be the guy who, who gets the power play time for the rest of the season. Now it's the Arizona Coyotes power play for the rest of the season. So, you know, maybe not massive value, but if you're looking for a guy who might be able to get you some power play points, who's pretty far under the radar, Valimaki is one. Now, uh, for a guy whose value I think will get hurt, I think Max Domi probably. Um, mm. He's on a tear right now. I think he has 13 points in a seven-game point streak, something along those lines. But a lot of that's been with Patrick Kane, and, and they've been putting up those numbers. 
if Domi gets traded, he's not going to be playing more than 18 minutes a night on a contender and not having the the kind of role that he has in Chicago. Now, he still might be, you know, fantasy relevant kind of and, and be able to contribute. But I think, you know, what we're seeing in these past few weeks is probably peak Max Domi. Uh, and, and that won't continue after the deadline. Hmm. Yep, yeah, well, that makes sense. So this year we've seen the likes of guys like Tage Thompson, Jack Hughes, and Jason Robertson become essentially first round fantasy players. Let's play a bit of a, a futures game here. So for dynasty leaguers out there, name a player who will make that jump next season. I think my guess is Andrei Sveshnikov. Um like you know, the, the players you talk about, right? Robertson and Hughes and and even Thompson, they had already started to show some signs now. I don't think signs to be make this big leap. Like I think in all three cases, they've exceeded expectations this year. Um, but so what we've seen from Sveshnikov, you know, he's already in like his fifth year in the league and he's 22 or 23 years old. Mm -hmm. um, but he's, he's scored more than 30 goals and uh, what he had 68 points last year. I think he's on pace for something like that this year, but he's a guy who generates shots and hasn't had the benefit of, kind of a big percentage season, like where his on-ice shooting percentage or his own shooting percentage is really inflated. And and I, I don't think it's that much of a reach if, if you got, you know, slight improvement from Sveshnikov and then a, and a spike in the percentages that all of a sudden he's a guy who might give you, you know, 90 plus points. And, and if he does that, generates shots on goal, gets more than two hits a game, there's a lot of fantasy value there. And so, yeah, he, he would be, I guess, my my first choice of, of guys who kind of haven't, you know, busted out to be the the stars like Thompson and Robertson and Hughes. I, I like that. It's funny. I've been on this Svechnikov train every year saying, this is the year, this is the year. <laughs> and that was, I was like that with Nathan McKinnon for his first several seasons too. I kept waiting. And then finally, I think it was like the year that I finally quit. Then he went, went nuts. So <laughs> that, I get that's how it goes. This and, and try not to quit Svechnikov next season because I was almost ready just waiting for that upper echelon breakout. So that's that's good advice, Scott. And really just great insight throughout this segment. We really appreciate it. And before we let you go, is there anything you want to plug? Anything you're working on right now? You have the floor, my friend. Well, um, you can always find my stuff at my Twitter account at by Scott Cullen. Uh, and daily, I'm doing NHL best bets for sports book review. Um, and you can find their Twitter account at SBR review. Uh, and really, you'll be able to find my stuff on Twitter and I'll be churning out hockey picks on a daily basis. And that, that includes articles. Uh, and then even um, usually later in the day, I'll have some uh, kind of extra player props that, uh, that didn't make the articles. So um, that that's the easiest stuff to find. And then, and then one, once a week uh, in McKean's hockey, I do 20 fantasy points that, uh, that kind of keeps me connected. Okay. Well, that's good to know. And Scott, again, Excellent segment. Thanks so much for coming on the show. We definitely would love to have you back if you'll if you'll come back and uh, keep up the great work. Oh, for sure. Thanks a lot, guys. Lots of fun. Great stuff from Scott Cullen. I expected nothing less. And Stephen, now it is your turn to become the sage. And I want to hear a breakdown of a prospect that was just traded in the past week. And you have something to say about this player. So give us the goods on Vitaly Kravtsov, Stephen. Well, Vitaly Kratsov is a guy that I had some high hopes for when he got drafted. This was a big forward who, you know, he played a full season in the KHL before he got drafted, which I think you can't ignore. He didn't put up a ton of points. But when it comes to European European prospects playing against pros, you kind of have to ignore the point totals a lot. And uh, he showed some promise uh, the year after. Uh, it came over to the, to the AHL, didn't play that great, went back to the KHL. And it was just kind of like, OK, well, don't worry, it'll take some time. You know, this it's a big adjustment going from Europe to going to North America and trying to find your way. But this is someone who never really found their way at the Rangers. And now granted, this was a team that they were focused on the future when he was there and the future started to come really quickly and they had to make the moves to be as competitive as possible. And all of a sudden Kratzoff kind of just found himself to be the odd man out. And whenever he would get into the lineup and try to play a bigger role, if he didn't produce right away, I felt like he got penalized for it. Granted, he didn't do a lot to help his game. There was a lot of times where it looked like he was floating out there uh, to go back to the Zetterland thing. It kind of looked like he was doing cardio out there at some points. But I, I think it's someone where in Vancouver, a team that isn't going to be going to the playoffs, uh, 
it seems to be putting a lot of onus now on these young guys to see what they can do, like Atu Ratti and Vasily Podkols. And I think having him there could be a big momentum shifter. I think this is kind of his last chance, and I wrote this for Daily Faceoff, that this could be his last real chance to prove what he can do in the NHL because, you know, he's a restricted free agent, hasn't produced a lot. I'm not sure if Vancouver really wants him in the lineup if he goes out there and kind of plays the way he was doing with the Rangers this year. So he needs to show that he's capable of being a full-time NHL or going forward. I think he could do it. And that's why you should maybe buy low on him because this is someone who's got a lot of motivation right now and on a team that's going to give him those opportunities. It's hard for an underperforming player to get ice time on a Stanley Cup contender, especially when they're going up there making trades. Now, you look at Vancouver, there's no pressure. I think this is the chance to kind of buy on him. Okay, that's interesting. Yeah, I wonder about the buy low. And even Vasily Podkols, and not like he was traded, but another player which I think had similar hype, maybe a bit more hype even, but a similar statistical profile as a first-round pick. And I projected both those players to be kind of stat stuffers because they have a bit of size and edge to their game, especially Podkols. And so it'll be interesting to see if Kravtsov gets a bigger opportunity down the road and maybe he finds his way finally into fantasy relevance. We will see. Okay, Stephen, we're going to switch gears now to the ProLine Plus best bet of the week. And I'm going to follow the path that Scott Cullen earlier on this show already laid out. I have the same idea, but I'm taking it even more to the extreme with a, a, a hotter take. So here's my logic, okay? I'm looking at the Stanley Cup futures. I'm looking at the trade deadline. And I joked on Twitter earlier this week that the Eastern Conference has acquired the Western Conference, but it's true. So much top talent has gone over to the other side, which means, you know, Bor Horvat and Vladimir Tarasenko, Ryan O'Reilly, the list goes on and on, Timo Meyer. And what's interesting is, on one hand, you can say, wow, the East is devastating. But on the other hand, the East is going to beat up on each other. And only one team can win every series. You're going to have a lot of good teams being eliminated. Meanwhile, in the West, teams have not geared up to the same extent. The conference looks way more wide open, in my opinion, especially the Pacific Division. So I'm looking at some of those futures, and I think there's good value there. And we know Scott mentioned Dallas, Vegas, Edmonton. Those are good picks as well. But I looked even further down the list for an even bigger home run swing. I'm looking at the Winnipeg Jets plus 2,600. And again, if you're watching this and about to overreact, shut up. Listen to what I'm going to say. I'm not saying I'm picking the Jets to win the Stanley Cup, goddammit. I'm just saying this is great value. Plus 2,600. They have the 15th best Stanley Cup odds, a team that's been the division leader in the Central most of the season. They just added Nino Niederreiter. You have a lot of top talent. Kyle Connor, Nikolai Ehlers, Mark Scheifele, Pierre-Luc Dubois, possible Norris Trophy threat in Josh Morrissey, and most importantly, Connor Hellebuck. The great equalizer is someone who can steal a series, maybe the Vezina Trophy front runner. And again, if you look at how wide open the West is, the Jets, I think, have as good of a chance as anyone to make a surprise run, especially with Hellebuck stealing games. Then when you factor in those incredible odds, plus 2,600, 15th in the league, to me, that's the type of, of team that you want to take a home run swing on. So again, don't overreact. I'm not saying the Jets are going to win the Stanley Cup. They are not my number one pick, but I think they have the best value right now if you're betting on Stanley Cup futures. So I would make that bet. I think it's pretty exciting. You just never know what's going to happen. What do you think, Stephen? I was, you know, I still had high hopes for them heading into the season when a lot of people thought this was a group that really need to blow things up. And part of it was because I still believed in Connor Hellebuck. He kind of is like Sergei Bobrovsky, where one season he's great, one season he's not so great. This year, he's been incredible. And look at that, what the team is right now. And, you know, they might have an easier path to the Stanley Cup final than the Eastern Conference representative. But, you know, the Western Conference fight to make it into the playoffs is going to be a challenge. And I think a lot of teams are going to be playing just must-win hockey all the time. And I think that could carry into the playoffs. So, again, don't ignore that Western Conference right now. It'll be very interesting. And before we finish this segment, a word from our sponsor, ProLine Plus, is not just another sportsbook being the only sportsbook that gives 100% of the profits back to Ontario. ProLine has been your local trusted sportsbook for over 30 years, now offering Ontario sports fans more ways to play in-store, online, or take the game on the go with the ProLine app. With your favorite sports at events right at your fingertips, download the ProLine app and bet in-app with ProLine Plus today or head over to ProLinePlus.ca to learn more. All right, Stephen, we have some questions coming in. I'm pretty sure one of them is from literally my dad, which is pretty fun. So <laughs> let's get started. I like that. We'll save his for last. I like his. Uh, Ranton Raven asks, uh, bad fantasy stat settings has led to my free agent pool being predominantly shot blocking defensemen. Do you have a good ratio for point scoring to banger stats? 
Yeah, that's a good question because it's hard to get it right. You want the banger defenseman to have value that sort of feels like real life or a grinding guy, like, you know, a guy like a Jake McCabe, for example. In real life, it's like, oh, the Leafs made a good get. You want that player to feel valuable in your fantasy league too. We've been working on that in my main league for years and we, we've got it close. So right now we have five categories I'd call pure scoring plus minus, which could be a scorer or a banger. And then we have two, we have hits and blocks for bangers. We don't have penalty minutes because... I just I just think it's weird to, to reward something that's bad. So that is a way to bring in the great equalizer. That would be the easiest way to do it. If you have hits, blocks, and penalty minutes, that would make those types of players more valuable. Or you could remove a category. So one thing I've thought about doing is making four skater uh, offensive categories instead of five, which would mean removing, in our case, points. We have goals and assists, power play points and shots. Do you need points as well when you have goals and assists? So that would be one way to get the ratio a little bit closer because like you said, Renton and Raven, in our league too, we do tend to have a lot of banger type defensemen available on the wire and you can sort of pick them up and stream them if you're looking to catch up to your opponent in games and just need hits and blocks. So that implies that maybe our system is a little bit flawed. I think... Here's an article idea for you, uh, and maybe in the summer, just uh, kind of come up with the best st- stat categories and the best formats for each, or best point formats for every single type of fantasy hockey league out there. So people can, when people ask asking questions like this, you can write an article and just say, here you go. It's an idea. Uh, Eddie Johnson asks, hey boys, love the show and YouTube clips. We've been posting a lot of clips on YouTube, especially shorts, and it seems like they're doing very well. Uh, which already traded player do you think has improved their fantasy value the most? Well, thank you for the shout out, first of all, Eddie. Um, so I could go on another rant about Anthony Bovelia, but we've talked about him a lot in the last couple of weeks. He's on my team, and that's just the perfect example of someone whose value jump so i'm going to pivot to someone else and i don't want to just step on scott collins toes he's already given some good examples so i'm going to say ivan barbashev who i'm looking closely at just because they need him he had 26 goals last year he's quite a versatile player he can sort of play in any type of role do a little bit of everything he's not outstanding in any one category but with mark stone out i think that vegas is going to give him an extended look in that top six in his first game they immediately threw him in there with jack eichel so i just think that there's no reason to not keep giving him that opportunity. If you're giving up one of your top prospects in Zach Dean, you're not doing that if you're planning on using Barbashev in your bottom six. So I'm definitely expecting him to be a scoring line forward on the Golden Knights for the rest of the season. So I see a pretty big jump in value happening there. All right. Next question comes from Jerry Oakland Golden Seals. Hello, Matt Steven. My pool, one of many, has five prospects that can be kept for future. Prospect being less than 165 games. Any prospects to pick up now that could eventually become impactful next season or near future? Focus on teams involved in the Bedard lottery. Thanks. Okay, so I'm, for the sake of this exercise, I'll assume it's players that aren't in the league at the moment because I'm, I'm guessing that Jerry's looking to sort of get ahead and, and scoop someone that isn't owned right now. Um, so there's a few names I'm looking at. I think Simon Edvinson in Detroit, he was close to making the team at the start of this year. He couldn't stick. But just with his size, his all-around game, he could be someone who stuffs the stat sheet. Sometimes it's hard to tell because you just don't know every home team's different with how their scorekeeper adds stats. You don't know for sure what a guy's fantasy profile is going to be until you see him in action. Sometimes it's the player you don't expect. Oh, this guy gets a lot of hits. But I think that based on Edmondson's skill set, he will be someone that helps in banger categories as well. Uh, I'm also looking at Logan Cooley just for dynamic offensive ability. I think he makes the Coyotes next year. I think he's going to be there next year. Uh, but you can correct me if I'm wrong, Stephen. And of course, Shane Wright, who was close, knocking on the door. He ended up getting sent back, but I think he'll be ready next year. Uh, but Stephen, this is your wheelhouse even more than mine. So I want to hear what you think on this one too. Well, I'll go with one of Logan Cooley's uh, teammates, uh, and that's Jimmy Snuggerud, who uh, I, I, I every time I watch him, I feel like he's got to be one of the best prospects in the game right now. He's he's very close to getting fifty points. He's forty seven and thirty four games right now. He's going to play, I think, a big role when he gets to the St. Louis Blues as they kind of go through this this rebound era of trying to rebuild, and we'll see kind of how long of a rebuild this kind of is. And you throw Snuggerud in there, and I think he'll instantly be a top six forward. Uh, if you want to go a bit more long term and you can draft guys who haven't been drafted to the NHL, keep an eye on Mafe Mitchkoff. If you're willing to wait and you're in this for the long run, I think it's going to be worth it. This is a guy that, you know, a lot of people said before the year, like number two, and then he, a lot of people put him three, four. I'm 
I'm getting to the point where my next rankings, I might put him at number two, to be honest. He's just, he's like the way he played in the KHL after getting traded to a team that I think had what, four or five wins at the time he was traded to. And they, they still didn't win a lot of games, but throwing him in there and him being basically near a point per game player, we've never seen a draft eligible player perform like he did. And this is against some of the, the, one of the best men league men's league teams in the world. This is not a, a Russian junior league, but he is going down to play some, some extra Russian hockey that outside of the KHL now, but uh, man, I would not be ignoring his performance uh, long-term if you're willing to wait, but I go for Jimmy Snuggerud and, and, and Matthew Mitchkov for two guys to keep an eye on right now. Okay. So, that's exciting. Uh, Mitchkov. Okay. And, I got to read the next draft rankings. Okay. Uh, Mitchkov. I, I'm, I'm, I'm it's hard to not keep a number two because I think he might be the second best player in this draft, but there's so much reason to also not put him there, which is the long-term effect that like he might not be here for a while, not until not yeah. 2026 at the earliest. And there's no guarantee he actually does come over. Let's like, we, 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 even though that's assumed, you just never know when it mm-hmm. comes to Russian hockey players, unfortunately. So, uh, and this question comes from your dad. Mike Clarkin, uh, in a deep 16 team, 23 player keeper league. Hmm. I wonder who else is in this league. <laughs> teams have four goalies from two teams. Goalies key to winning contracts expire after three years. I can keep four guys and we'll keep Tage Thompson, Darlene Fiala, and one of Larkin, Carlson, Zegers, and Gustafson. Who is your fourth keeper and why? Okay. So the first thing I have to do is provide a disclaimer that I traded Zegers to my dad. So my opinion, you have to take with a grain of salt because you could argue that I'm trying to look good in, in terms of implying that I gave him a great player. So I am going to encourage Zegers as the pick, but I think it's only fair that I make that disclaimer first. But here's the reason, okay? And this is the this is the pitch that I gave when we made the trade in the first place. So I know Dylan Larkin's having a great year. He shoots the puck a lot. He's point per game right now. But Trevor Zegers is five years younger. And Dylan Larkin's 26 years old, has a career high of 71 points. Trevor Zegers is 21 years old, is on pace for 68 points, or at least was going into Monday's games. I haven't double-checked that stat now. So you're already producing at roughly the level of Larkin, and you're five years younger. You're also just more of an offensive player, whereas Larkin is asked to do more back and forth in terms of just being a a two-way force. So Zegers is just a naturally offensive, gifted player. And that supporting cast in Anaheim is going to keep getting better because they're going to get another top tier player. Unless it's Mitchkov, they have to wait a while. Uh, but if it's, let's say, Fantilli or, of course, Connor Bedard, that could be even better for Trevor Zegers. There's also just so many other prospects coming up in, in Anaheim's system. So I think Zegers, this year, he might finish with, you know, 65, 70 points. I think he could jump to 80 next year and 90 the year after. The ceiling is way higher than the other guys that my dad is listing. John Carlson. I think it's just scary what happened, the puck in the head, the eardrum or whatever it is, the ear. That injury ended Brian Little's career. You just don't know. The timeline's so mysterious with John Carlson. Also, the Capitals are just getting way worse. They're selling off pieces. So I think their fantasy peak is done now. And I know Philip Gustafson, that's the big decision that my dad is trying to make here because he's been so good this year. And I think it's tempting to keep him for sure. Um, But at the same time, Marc-Andre Fleury still has another year left. And goalies are just so fickle. If you don't have a goalie who's an absolute slam dunk bell cow number one, like I kept I kept UC Saros going into this year. I was like, well, yes, I'm going to keep UC Saros. That's a slam dunk. But as someone who's a late breakout, it's just harder to predict year after year. So someone who you think could be arriving might not be as good the next year. So that is why I lean toward Trevor Zegers. But Stephen, what do you think on this one? Yeah, I'm, I'm going with Zegers. I just like, I Anaheim's going to be, going far I, I i wrote about it before or when we i was in florida and just saying like you know i think this is a guy that this is a team that's going to have a lot of promise before long he's going to get a lot of help i think you know he this is kind of considered an off year i know it's kind of early in his career to be saying that but compared to what he did in his rookie season but i think the ducks are going to be one of the best teams in the league before too long so i'd say you know gold them as long as you can Okay, so we're in agreement. So, Dad, there you go. It means I made a good trade, and uh, you should come back and deal with me again in the future. And I would have uh, said that even without the context of knowing you were involved in that trade, too. Okay, there you go. So, Stephen, before we exit, it is trade deadline week, so I wanted that to be part of the theme for the starting lineup. And I want you to give me your top six snacks that you want to have handy during all the chaos on trade deadline day. So... I'm going to start it off with something probably a little boring, and I'll get more interesting, I promise. Carrots. 
you know, <laughs> yeah, this is gonna be a busy day. You gotta Come stay focused. On. Carrots are my favorite snack, baby carrots specifically. You know, they're easy to eat, they're they're good, but they're just something where you gotta eat something healthy because it's gonna be a very busy day and you gotta stay focused. So I'm going with that. Number two, I'm going to fuzzy peaches. I think fuzzy peaches are one of the best sour candies. And you can kind of say sour cherry blasters. They're essentially the same thing. Uh, those are two that I love. Uh, goldfish crackers. I want to give a shout out to Scott Maxwell, who agreed that they're, they're an excellent snack. Uh, one of the best snacks around. And I used to be someone who liked to try like the barbecue flavor or the extra cheese. No, just the original ones are honestly just the best. Uh, I'm also going to go with number four being Chex Mex, which you can't get in Canada. But every time I go to the States and, and when I go to these these trips for scouting stuff in, in the States, a lot of it is the food's really fun. And I always try to get Chex Mex when I can. So that's definitely one I'm going to go with. Uh, number five, I, you know, Reese's. Reese cups are my favorite. I think those are one of the best chocolates ever. So you got to get that. And uh, I had a very giant tub that I got for Christmas. I barely touched it, but I, you know, the deadline is coming up. And I don't know if we can call this a snack, but it's listed as an appetizer at most restaurants. And I'm going with nachos. I think you just need to have nachos at pretty much any major event. And the trade deadline is no exception. So I'd say those are my picks. Those are good picks. I feel like my daughter, I, my oldest daughter, Evie, might have helped you make that list because those are a lot of her favorite snacks, like carrots, fuzzy peaches, and goldfish, all these things. Those are her good. jams. For me, for me, it's all about I want a snack on deadline day that's not going to leave residue on my fingers because okay. I don't want to have to be going wash my hands and going back to the computer. So I think that's a, a close consideration. So peanut butter cup, that's the only thing. You get, like, I find melty, chocolatey fingers, for example. Or fuzzy peaches, you get that dust, right? So... I don't know if your list is the most practical, but I respect it in terms of the actual picks. Yeah, I, I, I'd say, you know, it's it, it's all kind of a mix and you probably don't want to have any of that stuff together. But uh, it's just, you know, I, I'm, I, you got to have some healthy food when you're uh, when you're working all day. I'll say that. That's fair. OK, well, that concludes this week's episode. We'll be back next week. We'll be breaking down the fantasy implications of the trade deadline when it's finished. Thank you to Stephen. Thank you to Scott Cullen. And thanks, Dad, for the question. Love you. That's it for this week, everybody. Have no idea.